So, I'm Sarah Crompton and I'm a writer and a commentator about dance and I've spent many happy evenings in the Coronet Theatre. So I'm really pleased to be here now to host this question and answer with uh, Russell Maliphant and Dana Foras as part of the Coronet Inside Out season. And just talking to you both kind of really brings back a lot of happy evenings and it seems odd now to be in a digital space when before we've been in the theatre. So that made me think about space and if I was talking about your work Russell I would say that it's really about the flow of bodies through space and through light and I thought it would be interesting to start off by saying how how does the space that you're working in affect how you feel about the choreography? Um, space is kind of set and setting to some extent and with with all pieces, particularly because we work so much with the dark, the, the darkness is a setting, but there's a relationship to the audience that is a kind of an important part of a response as a performer. And that reversed the audience to the performer. And um, the, the space at the coroner is really quite particular I think because of the way it's um, shaped with the what used to be the circle wall around the space you have a kind of frame for the work um, which is I've never seen anywhere else it sits within it's kind of... it's quite unique yeah um, and also you you view down into that so everyone has a view of the frame around the, the lighting on the floor, if you see that, or the, um, you know, the figures on the stage. So that's kind of, that's particular. I, um, I well, we both really kind of started performing in larger mm -hmm. spaces. So Royal yeah. Ballet or Sadler's Wells, Royal Opera House or Sadler's Wells. Um, and then, I mean, for me, when I started to make solo work um, as an independent artist, that was, um, that was beginning small and doing, you know, performances at the Arnold Feeney or uh, in Bristol, which I don't know how many seats it is, or the ICA, which might be 100 seats, or Chisenhale. Um, Bonnie Bird. Bonnie Bird. Um, and I... I always really enjoyed that close proximity where you can hear the audience breathing. You can hear if they're with you or if they're a little bit um, restless. Restless. Is it yes. me, is it more immediate. It's very, it's very immediate. It's a sensory engagement together, mm -hmm. um, which you, you you have different things going on if you're at a large auditorium and you have maybe an orchestra pit um, so the performance is different the, perfor the, the way you the perform. performance techniques are different I think to in what kind that, of way are they different well to make that reach across the orchestra pit into you know the low stalls and to also to manage the difference between the stalls and the amphitheater you may if you're in an opera house it's a flying house you know you have an enormous height above you usually a lot of elaborate scenery to contend with. So the perspective of the figure is a, a completely different um, visual picture to a, a small jewel box, you know, that maybe you open and look into. Um, the energetic reach mm. that is um, necessary as a performance technique at you know the Colosseum or the Opera House, or um, you know if you were performing somewhere like Herod's Atticus, um, is quite different than you would need in the Coronet, um, and you know the because of that engagement, that form of engagement, um, 
and and then there's certain works that sit because it's a, a relatively small um, frame for the work there's a, a particular works that sit within that frame and you know some that don't sit within that frame because they're made for a different um, a different frame really you know a different uh, yeah how and um, I should say that um, a lot of the questions that I'm going to ask have been sent in by people because people wanted to know the answer. So how did you um, start performing at the coroner? That was one of the, uh, the questions that came in online. Um, I, I met Anda um, when she had the other space, the print room. And I can't remember how we, we met, but someone put us in touch and I went to see the space and there were a lot of things that I found really interesting about the space and at the same time I felt like I didn't have anything that was quite small enough that would sit well there um, and then you know we kept in touch and then I saw the coronet space and when Anda showed it to me, it had the stage dropped, and I I thought, oh, this is a this is a great great space. I really love it with this frame of the circular wall around it, um, and I could find some pieces from past works that would fit within the framework of that and within the space of that. So we tried Maliphant Works 1 um, and that seemed to go well. So we tried Maliphant Works 2 and then, you know, we've just completed Maliphant Works 3 before the, the lockdown. We just got it in there. Yeah, which was good and very memorable. And Donna, as a performer, what's it like to perform there? I mean, you know, how do you feel on that stage? I love the coronet. I love that the entire atmosphere. It's like a theatrical fantasy. I was thinking about it last night that it's actually it was my idea of what a theatre was probably before I even set foot in one. And it's just that is a, is a beautiful place. I mean, even down to the dressing rooms, you know, that everything has Anders kind of design touch to it. Um, you feel embraced by the entire building. I do, um, I, you know, the, from the moment you walk in, you're kind of a part of it. And um, just the journey from the, you know, being in the dressing rooms backstage is quite complicated, uh, small doors, uh, stair ladders to reach the stage. You know, you're under um, a kind of platform, backstage it's uh it's a bit of a rabbit's warren and uh it's a very just an interesting journey to the stage so it's it's it was like that kind of um culmination of all my theatrical fantasies i love it yeah. as as russell touched on earlier you both started in completely different settings and, and I think it's quite a good moment just to, to fill in the background of your careers that you both started in um, as ballet dancers, didn't you? In, in huge unit know, spaces. So um, do you want just, Donna, to start tell people how you came into dance in the first place? Well, I grew up in Australia. Um, I lived on the coast in Queensland. So it was very much a beach culture um, there. I think it was quite in, um, an inviting place for people to come and retire to, um, which meant that actually a lot of artists who'd been working in Sydney and Melbourne came up to retire there and often found themselves bored and began coaching or teaching. So I was really fortunate to land into that lap of um, some incredible dancers. Um, my first important teacher was uh, a woman called Kathleen Gorham, who I think she'd been a founding member of Ballet Rombert, 
and then Borovansky, which was the um, company in Australia before the Australian Ballet formed. Um, so Robert Heltman, all these people from Australia were there. And uh, she just had such an incredible imaginative approach. Um, it was... And what to explain her? So then I I I, um, I worked with her for about three or four years, and um, and then I had some other teachers uh, joined on Ransley, very big teachers in Australia. Had a large school. Um, my mother was a pianist, and she would often accompany us for class. Um, so there was a very musical element to the work that I was doing because she was also sharing a lot of you know, music. Um, I studied classical violin also, which was a really big part of my education. Um, and then I ended up coming overseas to um, do the Adeline Jenner competition, which is an RAD competition. Um, I won a silver medal that year and there was uh, no gold awarded, but the um, there were some teachers there from the Royal ballet school that invited me to come and audition the next day. So I did that at eight o'clock the next morning. I was at the Talgarth Road Studios, which was, again, incredibly a kind of romantic uh, attachment and, and connection for me. Um, I had all these coffee table books of Anthony Crick May and Lynn Seymour working with Kenneth Macmillan. And, you know, that was, I was suddenly in those studios. Um, I spent two years in the school and then I uh, graduated into the company. At mm -hmm. And Russell, there's this weird thing, you've got symmetrical careers, but you're sort of a few years ahead. So you, you also joined the Royal Ballet School at 16. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I, what had you been doing before that, before you come into the Royal Ballet School? I'd been, um, I'd been going to a, um, <laughs> I've been going to somewhere called the Patricia Newman School of Dance in Cheltenham. Um, and I did tap modern ballet. Um, and at 14, I had decided I was going to be serious about ballet. And I did something called an opinion audition at the Royal Ballet, where you could go and do a class with the, with, at the school. And they would say, your yes. legs are too short. There's no hope for you or <laughs> you're in with a chance, you know. Feet don't point. Um, they, they saw me and said, yeah, work hard over these next two years and come back and audition for us when you're 16, which I did. I got in and um, then joined the company and then went to Sadler's Wells Royal Ballet, which was at the time the touring company. And how long did you stay there? So I stayed there for seven years, um, the same, same amount of time as Dana. We never met when we were there. Right. I think she joined when I left. Mm. Um, and... But even so, I mean, the, I think the Covent Garden Company and the Saddle as Wells Company didn't really mix and during my time there so much anyway. There was, the Saddle as Wells were always on a world tour, you know, mm. or, or a national <laughs> tour somewhere, so. Yeah, it's endless touring. It was really a lot of touring at the time and eight shows a week and, um, yeah. So uh, why did you leave? What, first of all, why did you leave? Why did you move on? Both of you really. So the, the character of Sadler's Wells was changing at, at that time. You know, it had always been a kind of company that did um, tri quite a lot of touring, well, an endless amount of touring, and triple bills, eight shows a week. Um, and in, the, in that triple bill, and quite a lot of new work. So um, you were often learning new pieces. And in those triple bills, if you didn't really like the rep of, of one of the pieces, it's kind of okay, you've got another two, and then probably a, another triple bill later in the week, or you know, the following week, or something like that. So you were always moving on. And at that point, um, somewhere around, yeah, after I'd been there about five years, it changed to um, 
we, did, we started doing Peter Wright's Swan Lake and Peter Wright's Sleeping Beauty. And, um, you know, they were very good productions. Um, and we did them a lot. You know, we did a hundred shows of Swan Lake and a hundred shows of Sleeping Beauty. And um, I think in that, it's, it's very different. Uh, there's a repetition and it all becomes about what role are you doing in that piece and how often are you doing that role? And if you're doing, if you're working towards, um, I was a Corafe soloist um, at, as that time progressed. And at, as you, um, if you're always doing the corps de ballet roles and then you're trying to work on doing the Prince in Sleeping Beauty or Swan Lake or something Prodigal like Son. that or Prodigal Son or, um, it's, it's quite, it's quite a difficult time. You've got to kind of jump that. And then when you become a principal, it's, um, it might be easier because you're not doing well easier in some ways. It's a different focus because you've got your you're, performance uh, schedule is completely different because, you know, if you were to, if you're a, a corps de ballet member, but you're given an opportunity the next night you're back in the line with the swans or, you know, townspeople and this kind of thing. So you're constant, but you know, a lot of the principals maybe get one or two shows. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a different, different difficulty in that. But I think around that time, I, I thought, I'm not, I'm not actually enjoying this in the way that I had for the first five years. There's, there's something about this process of doing this night after night after night. And I, I was enjoying classes, but then the rehearsals of this again with, cause someone else is new is coming into this role, but you, you know, I think somewhere around that time, I started to hear myself kind of moaning. And you know, when you get to be a moaner in a company, it's like, it's, it's all wrong. You know, you're, it's, it's not where you should be. And I, I kind of realized it's not where I should be, but I didn't really know where I should go or what I should do. And I started to look around um, at other companies. And then, you know, there were also some great people who wanted to leave also, who were in a similar kind of feeling. And we, in the end, we all decided to leave together. They, they formed a company, Dance Advance, um, Susan Crow, Jennifer Jackson, Sheila Stiles, Michael Batchelor, um, Stephen Sheriff, and myself. And we, uh, you know, we did the first um, stint with uh, Kenneth, Sir Kenneth Macmillan, who made um, sea, of sea of Troubles on us. Um, and we had a piece by Chu Song Go, an American choreographer. And we had a, a kind of group work made by the four choreographers in the company, of which I wasn't one at the time. I was just dancing. Um, and so it went on. And Macmillan was important to you both, because Donna, your, your kind of dancing career, I mean, he, he chose you very early on to dance with him. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yes, and when I was um, in my final year at school, it was, um, a big birthday celebration for Damien at de Valois. So uh, Kenneth was commissioned, I suppose, to uh, create a piece on the students. Um, so I created Soiree Musicale with him at, I was 16, 17. Um, it was a fantastic time. We worked every Saturday. Usually the school was like, you'd have one class on a Saturday and then you'd be finished um, and we would kind of stay and work all day on Saturday um, creating solos and pas de deux and coda and it was just a, a little um, celebratory piece um, I suppose and Ian Sperling costumed it who had done the costumes for uh, Elite Syncopation so it was super fun uh, to be involved in that and I think that that really changed uh, my whole idea of being a dancer. I had, like I said before, I had all these books that showed the process between choreographer and dancer. And that's what really attracted me, I think. That, that just seemed so interesting and 
so creative. Um, I then moved into the company and uh, he uh, cast me to dance Juliet quite young. Um, there was a bit of uh, tussling about that. He, he wanted it to happen. Not sure my director wanted that to happen. Um, and it was a, it was a strange um, dual, you know, feeling that it was a good thing and, and maybe I wasn't wanted there. So I, I didn't, I, I just took it and went with it. Um, I did a lot of Kenneth's pieces there and um, really loved having the input. He was, he was always coming in to rehearse at that period and uh, he was then went on to make Prince of the Pagodas and Winter Dreams. So I was um, often in the studio during those processes and uh, it, was, um, it was really great time. I think that as like Russell says, you, when you do a lot of repetition and, um, you know, I think a, a childhood dream of that kind of swan and fairy and all those kind of, um, you know, make the make believe world of the classics changed for me. So then it became more important that I was just working with a choreographer. And I was quite lucky at the time in the, in the company, a lot of people came, Forsyth came and sat in the middle because Sylvie had just arrived. And um, it was just always more interesting to me to be in the room with the choreographer, not a repetitor, just teaching you the steps and not really having a connection to the history of that piece. I found there was a lot missing, but it was way more direct communication when the choreographer was there. So I think that I was feeling to move from, move away from the company um, after Kenneth died, um, sadly, because it was, uh, it just wasn't the same place for me without him there. So um, I decided to move on. And uh, on that day, I ran into Russell, literally the day I left. Right. And a new partnership was formed. <laughs> um, Russell, when had you dis how important do you think it is that ballet Sorry, ballet? you just froze. Oh, sorry. In terms of um, your choreography, how important is that ballet background? How much does that feed into what you do as a choreographer? Um, I think that it depends who I'm working with. I, I guess I looked at ballet and studied it and ingrained it for um, 20, 20 odd years. Um, maybe, well, yeah, maybe longer, um, but certainly 20 years solid, easy, um, you know, going deep into it. Um, <clears throat> and I think even a lot of my work after that, if it, it's, it's still in relationship to that, if I'm going away from it, it's, it's because it's there that I'm moving this way. It's not, you, you don't just forget about it. Um, and there are lots Although of- Although when we met, you were very far from it at that stage. I think you'd worked, with DVA, you worked with Laurie Booth, you worked with Michael Clark, and you were going through that kind of unlearning phase of, you know, the, That's the, kind physical, of what I mean by the physicality the... of ballet. The up, you know, the pull up instead of the grounding. You were studying capoeira, you were starting to kind of, you know, go in. <laughs> Excuse me. Um... So, so that was a that was a totally different Russell at that point, um, which was which was really interesting to see. I mean, it, it was totally inspiring to me to know that he'd come from the similar place to where I'd come from, and yet he could move like that just through studying other dance forms. That was like super exciting. So. Um, and then I think after, well, probably when we made Shear, mm -hmm. we, 
you started to pull more line, more classical things from that. And then he went into the work with Sylvie, which obviously, you know, she had her great <laughs> uh, technique to, you know, to utilize. So for him, that was, uh, you know, he, he understood that because he'd come from that. I think there's the, there's the learning that is part of my practice. And some of that involved an unlearning of things that were, I was experiencing in my body um, in, within a different context. Say, if, if you put a ballet dancer into deviate physical theater, it's which a different- you, They did. <laughs> which they did. Um, it holds a different currency than it does within, um, you know, within the Royal Ballet or within you know, a ballet company. Um, so I, the value given to that and the, and the context around that, that I realized suddenly, oh, there's so much else that I want to learn. Mm -hmm. And some of that involves unlearning what I have already spent a lot of time. And I'm not sure how to stop some of those um, holding patterns that I've trained for years to have. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how to undo those. And that's a work in itself. How, how did you undo them? So, so at what point do you decide that you want to choreograph and therefore you want to, to alter the way you move? I, I think I realized I wanted to alter the way I move when I started to work with Deviate. Right. Um, and, I didn't know that. You know, some of that, um, you know, the project that we worked on for Dead Dreams of Monochrome Men, um, I think it was a 10 week making process and um, I think we did 10 performances of it. So it was, you know, relatively short period of time, you know, to, to pick up a, a technique or a practice. I mean, to even really begin to engage with it deeply it's got to be three years, four years, you know, something. Um, so I, I, was, I felt like I was really on the, on the tip of something there. And, you know, I started doing yoga a lot um, in 88. Um, and that uh, I, I kept practicing. I still practice some now. Um, and I think working with Laurie Booth, that was, that was again a different context because um, we, we could utilize in, in improvisation, you could utilize many of the um, ideas of classical language, a glissade, a jeté, um, an arabesque, but not, not fully form them. You might use the dynamic of a glissade or a, a grand rond de jambe or um, a chasse or a, you know these different or turns you know these kinds of things you could use them and actually not necessarily finish the the full here I am in arabesque you know because then it's it's clear it's obvious it's but if you do the the first part and move on to you abstract it a little bit take it a little bit away from its form, but it's still informed by the form. Um, so I think I had a different, uh, had a different value of, of ballet within the improvisational context. Um, and that's, that's kind of continued to be part of the mix, I would say, that I work with now, that I do improvisation and you know, some of that might be to do with more uh, an improvisational way of movement. I mean, the way we learn steps in classical ballet, you're often learning A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know, you've got your first position, second position, or your chasse, prepare, pirouette. Of those, yeah. So you, you move those around. But in, if you're learning something like capoeira, the way that you practice, you learn 
a, a roundhouse kick and you've got a kind of uh, a, a leg movement and then you improvise with it. So all the time you're working with a flow into and a flow out of and a between. So you're kind of working with transitions, which is a very different model of processing information and putting information together than the classical ballet route. And they both lead to incredible movement if practitioners are very, very good. So is, um, it, is it right to say from that that you became a choreographer because you were interested in moving differently? So that in a sense, your choreographic practice springs out of your dance practice. I mean, that, that's how it sounds from that. Is that right, would you say? Yes, I would say that the things I was learning physically um, and finding and that were, you know, I was passionate about, they were interesting, they were, they gave me energy to explore those things. Um, that was the fuel to choreograph. And, um, you know, actually the first time that I choreographed, I, I made a, if we say that improvisation is different to choreography and yet very related because it's kind of instantaneous composition. You're having to make the composition in the moment. So you want to know about what's come before, what's come after, and you want to be um, making a decision based on those elements and dynamics and really what's happening with the light, what's happening with the music. Um, so the f I made an improvisation, a structured improvisation for myself. Um, and then that was seen by Ricochet Dance Company, who asked me if I would choreograph something for them. And I had never choreographed anything up to that point. I had made a structured improvisation for myself. So I, you know, I was facing unemployment at that time. As a freelance artist, I had nothing that I was moving on to. So I thought, well, let's, you know, I should. I could do that and maybe I could teach them improvisation and use the skills that they have and play with those and which is what we did over a process and actually the piece was it had its moments but it was yeah you know kind of good days bad days you know improvisations can come and go um, and I knew that I could do better and they knew that we had done better on certain days than others so they asked me again and we did a second piece and then I choreographed, I set things. So we started to have a different process and putting things together and that kind of got me really interested in um, how to structure things, how to work with dynamics, um, how to work with light ultimately as I started to work with Michael and um, so it went that way, really. And so one of the questions that came in was, was what inspires your choreography? What, what now would you be inspired by? Mm, I think the dancers that I'm working with is, um, is a, a very big inspiration and in how they move, what they embody. Um, the techniques, the uh, idiosyncrasies, the styles, um, the range. And that's set within a context of the lighting and how, the, how light affects what they're doing, how they affect the light um, and, and sound worlds. Mm. And another question was, what's it like choreographing for Donna? So you've done, down the years, an immense amount with Donna, you know. She's always um, been there as an assistant, as part of the process, even if she wasn't appearing on stage. Yeah. But what's it like when you actually make a piece together? Um, well, we've had big breaks in making together. I think from 2000 and two I think about then we did Shia. Yeah. Yeah, two thousand and one. Two thousand and one. And then in the next piece that we made together, 
was 2015. 2015. Um, so, you know, there was, a, and then we've made. Well, we've made two before Sheer as well. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Um, but there, yeah, the big Remember break that? in there. <laughs> um, and, you know, things, things shift, but because Dana knows very much part of my process, I think that there's, um, there's a kind of ease mm -hmm. between us that doesn't really necessarily need to be explained verbally so much. Mm. There's a kind of um, kinetic understanding or... Um, yeah. And you, I mean... I mean, I think we should... A lot of it. So it's... Um, there's, a, there's a lot of things that are simply agreeable. You know, usually the any any making any route to take is agreed mm. I, I don't think we've ever had a, a tug of war over something that kind of you know clear um it doesn't mean it's always easy i mean we definitely have you know ups and downs in the studio and um times that his uh, Russell's way is a lot to do with forming a piece. He'll he'll really work in very broad brushstrokes. So he wants to put parts together that maybe you're improvising for a long time in in a specific light. That as you're in it, you're not really understanding what it, the visual is that he's seeing. And sometimes those things that maybe don't match up. So it's and a tempo kind of. There might not be. There might not be um, steps, so to speak. There, there's a kind of there's a certain way of moving that is still improvised with, and it's like um, I'm seeing it, thinking, okay, I know that when there are steps and dynamics and pauses, and then that will be good for this amount of time. So let's go on to get the structure to see where that needs to change, and that will inform the music, and that will inform the light. And we need to make this transition to that. So there's no point in going over all the little details of this part, whilst which maybe Dana, as the dancer, wants to go over the, the details. Mm, right. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, just <laughs> hold on for that. We'll get there, but not at the moment. Usually the week before the performance goes on, we might get there. So that's a frustrating thing for me as a dancer, you know, that I, I want to know what I'm working with so I can deepen it and make it stronger um, and understand it fully. Um, and yet Russell wants to be very vague about that. So I think there can be a kind of tussle in that because our tempos are different. You know, I want to kind of have a little more regulated, uh, information and he'll want to rush on. The making though, the making is very, if we make material and we're making a duet contact or um, arms or you know whatever relationship, that's, we're really fast with that. And it can flow like that, those things. If we have the right sound and, and the right atmosphere in the room, we, um, we've, we've got some great, um, improvs that have only been a kind of a touchstone for things that we've created but i think they could actually be things on their own which is nice to have but you know they're from years ago and uh, we have many films because we video everything we're our own rehearsal directors so you know not having a coach in the studio with you is something to to find to figure out you know you don't have you as a dancer you've always got that person there that teacher the mentor the choreographer you know telling you but then when we're both inside a piece um the video has to be that for yeah. us yeah i'm gonna pause i can hear a weird rattle can you hear a weird rattle or is it just something i'm getting i and can't hear any okay no Okay, no one else got me. My kids laughing outside, actually, they're in the garden. They must have just heard us. <laughs> must be something rattling. Okay, I'm going to, so, um, 
I'm going to just do a sort of quick fire round now on your careers because people have asked very specific questions about your careers. Okay. So I'm going to, um, in the just kind of quick questions, which are not really very well linked. Um, so have you, either of you, ever had serious injuries and have they ever happened while you're on stage dancing? You go. <laughs> I, I have had kind of one, I, well, no, I've had, couple of serious injuries I'd say two um, one was my arm um, I constricted the thoracic nerve bell I lost the use of my arm for uh, like it just wouldn't move there was no message getting through to move the shoulder and that um, that was like that for about nine months to a year so you know I was literally I put my arms up at the side that would happen there was nothing, just no brain message getting through to the shoulder. That was... And that was young. That was my it? third year at the Royal Ballet School, so... Um, when something happens to you like that, in that kind of moment, it's pretty significant, I think, because you see everyone else, like, taking their places, you know, and, and moving into the career that you've been working towards. I think that had a really big effect on it you. It was... It, I mean, at that time, my... Um, my practice, my technique and everything was going very well. I started to learn Colas in um, La Female Garde as the school performance, as a one-handed bum lift. Okay. In that, that something went out and, you know, it, it hurt. And I put my arm in a sling and, you know, went to see the doctor. And it eventually, you know, three days later, when my arm couldn't move, um, you know, I found out what that was. Um, but it, they gave me my third year at the Royal Ballet School again. And I, you know, I started, uh, as this was beginning to get better, um, you know, I, I got taken into the company. And then the other injury, I would say, um, I did a, um, tore something in my knee. Well, I tore the anterior cruciate ligament in my knee um, doing a, double cabriole um, and that was about two days before I was supposed to perform my first solo, uh, improvised solo as an independent artist um, and that took a long time, uh, you know, that took a long time to get, um, for, for me to get dancing again and I danced without an anterior cruciate ligament for 24 years but I had it reinstated um, in 2015, I think. Um, I've never had an injury. In a full... In a, I've never injured, well, no, I have. Yeah. I have actually, yeah. On your 50th birthday, yes. actually. In, you were performing at Onagata in Tokyo, and yeah. I went for his birthday. And I saw him do a really small jump <laughs> and something happened at the end of it. And I thought, I just knew something had gone wrong. And then he got through the performance um, in a great deal of pain, I'm sure. I think it fully dislocated and maybe you did the meniscus as well. But um, that, was, that was not nice to see. Um, well, yeah, I had a performance the next night and I... I did it, but uh, mm. gingerly. Mm. Yeah. We, did, we did quite a lot of years of when we were performing the solos one and two on tour. And so we were always, each of us in the wings while the other one was dancing. And I, there were many times during one performance of one where I would see his knee fully dislocate and he would do some kind of really imaginative roll, push it back in, get up and carry on. So he has a... In, in, extremely high pain to <laughs> and, and, a, and a and a you know and honoring the audience to continue is uh is something that's you know quite special i think i've i've had um i had a a, a fall down some steel stairs when i was at the royal ballet school and i fractured uh a lumbar vertebrae and shattered my coccyx. That was interesting. <laughs> um, I think the repercussions of that through my my spine has continued. I don't think I had 
it taken care of properly. I just rested and then carried on. I didn't really want to talk about it. I didn't really want to share that I'd had this, you know, issue. And um, it was, um, yeah, I've had some back problems. I tore my psoas, which ruptured a hip capsule, which was incredibly painful, not on stage, um, but it did stop me performing. Um, and that was a very long period where I was bedridden and um, I think Russell thought I wouldn't walk again, let alone dance. So, mm. um, you know, slowly we worked together really and I, there's just been so much of Russell's methods that, that are about deep listening and, um, you know, we don't have any trainers or support um physio this kind of thing we maybe see an osteopath when things feel like we can't take care of it but i think we would always try to work through things in in the methods that um you know russell's explored for just decades now um it's it's really interesting to be able to work on yourself to get yourself back rather than just, you know, lie on a bed and have someone else diagnose and take care of you. Um, and I think as that's really just been a necessity through being independent dancers, you know, not having that financial aid and, and benefits and, um, you know, pay if you're off work. Um, that you can take your time for things like that. We've really had to work through a lot of things and, um, and to great benefit, you know, it's, it's been a really interesting journey. What about mentors? Who have been important mentors to you both? I had, um, I had a mentor called Peter Bonaham, um, who worked in Ottawa at Le, Place de, uh, Le Groupe de la Place Royale. Um, and he used to have a company that only worked, um, in research and development and they would invite choreographers to come and develop something, uh, that they, they wanted to explore. And then they might have a showing and Assis Carrera, um, who's Canadian brought him over to the dance exchange. And um, I was lucky enough to do a process with him. Um, and that was, he was very good at mentoring because he didn't, um, he didn't want you to do anything other than go deeper into what you were trying to say. Um, and you know, that, that idea to dig deeper if it's not hitting the spot. Um, and, you know, to have someone who could give feedback of what he was getting as an audience member and um, whether that was, you know, working or... Um, so he was very good. And then I went over to Canada um, to do another process, a second process over there. And I... Some of the process, a man called Ted Senman Robinson, um, who's also a choreographer, but, but worked very closely with Peter Bonaham. Um, he mentored me also. And, you know, again, a very, a very interesting process. Um, and in the, same, in the same manner that they would just try to um, guide you really to, you know, what is it that you want to do here? Why? Um, it's not making steps for the sake of steps. Mm -hmm. Donna, what, what about you? Are there, who has inspired and mentored you? You know, there's so many different people for different stages um, of my time. Um, I mean, for sure, Kenneth Macmillan is right up there. Um, just the way that he was always interested in you as a person, if he, I think if he was working with you. Um, I've heard other dancers say that. I really felt that. Um, 
it was it was a lot to do with the imaginative approach um, to technique so not just this kind of you know gymnastic dry kind of perfecting things it was it was much more of, of opening my mind up to flow and um, to to going beyond where you feel are your limitations um, that was really interesting I also had a period of time where um, the company was about to the Royal Ballet was about to go on tour to Japan and um, my uh, the I had a, I had a, a difficult time that the oh this is going really badly. Um, <laughs> you talk about when you uh, yeah, I was, I, was I was overweight um, by the standards by of... the standards of the Royal Ballet. So I was not allowed on the Japanese tour. Right. And a really great teacher at the Royal, Royal Ballet at the time who taught class every day was a dancer called Betty Anderton, Elizabeth Anderton. Um, she was just a great friend and a really fantastically energized teacher. Um, I really adored her. And she knew about this and she put me in, in touch with Lynn Seymour. Uh, while the company were away on an eight-week tour, a six-week tour, uh, then it was a summer holiday. So I actually had three months working really intensively with Lynn Seymour one-to-one. -one. And I mean, yeah, I learned a huge amount of things from her regarding life, regarding stagecraft, movement and and all things that had been handed to her through Rudolf Nureyev, Robert Heltman, you know, and I, I just I love that kind of way with dance, you know, there's there's it, it's got to be person to person. Um, the links are made with your human connections. And um, what a privilege. I mean, I yeah. I would have to say someone also that probably has influenced both of us mm -hmm. in a way is Dreyas Reinecke. I was going to say him next. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's a Pilates teacher yeah. Yeah. and um, we both worked with him also right. at very different times of our careers and uh, he had a huge amount of knowledge in, of the body, um, was able to formulate um, uh, form exercises just for you, what you needed in your body. Um, brilliant. And also very aware of different techniques, having done ballet before he did Pilates. And then he worked with Ron Bear at the time that they were moving from a classical company to a contemporary company. And they had some fantastic teachers. Yeah. So that history of movement that he was um, party to, through all of those years and has a kind of approached many people individually um, what they need for their technique and their alignment and their um, capacity. And if he usually comes to our performances still today and his opinion is, is one that I rely on quite heavily. Yeah. Likewise. I feel all our conversations about the kind of outside world and the, the richness of influence that, you know, I think it's one of the amazing things about dance. It's not only a kind of physical form, but, but everything you're talking about is that kind of rich history that comes into everything that dancers do, which is, you know, to me, and, and, and I expect you one reason that, that this time of, you know, in lockdown, in quarantine is such a strange time of separation from everything like that. Um, and so I turning inwards now into the inside part of the conversation um, how have you sort of kept creative in lockdown when I mean at least you've got each other but but you're shut off from so much else how, how have you managed to do it uh, Russ first. Um, well um, I'd say I've been doing quite a lot of online work uh, because you know often there's not the time to do that and 
I love exploring new things. And there are some teachers that I had um, come across and wanted to go more deeply into the, some of the techniques that they were teaching. Um, so I've been doing quite a lot of that. Uh, and that's been, that's been really fun. Um, creatively looking for ways that we can work around the home. Um, so we've done a lot of uh, work in the garden and as there's no money coming in um, and a lot of money going out, you know, it's really, we're really frugal um, and kind of getting to that idea of repurposing and permaculture and um, trying to get the, the stasis right so that they'll be right so that um, things can um, look after themselves and sustain um, so we've been doing that in the garden and uh, finding ways that I can do something for free um, like you know if I've got to fix the paint the windows on the uh, three levels above ground um, how can I do that without having to spend a thousand pounds on the scaffolding um, so uh, or killing yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both would be both would be good. Um, and at the moment, I've got some climbing rope. I've got a harness. Um, if you never see me again, it's because oh! it's all gone. Um, Sorry, Donna. What about you? Um, well, I. I mean, I was a stay-at-home mum for ten years, so I'm. It's it's kind of known to me how to be at home a lot and. Uh, we are really fortunate to have a garden and we were really fortunate that last year we started really seriously taking care of the garden. Um, so we are growing a lot of vegetables and uh, I'm absolutely loving it. I cook a lot, so I like to cook with food from the garden. I mean, we also have three teenagers, so there's a lot of music in the house um, and we want to stay positive for them, really. We're both working with um, National Youth Dance Company, <clears throat> which we're not sure what is going to happen with that at the moment because it was supposed to premiere in April. Um, but I'm choreographing and Dana's doing the music for that piece. So we've been, um, I've been teaching a little bit um, the, the cast um, and on we Zoom. on Zoom, um, and we have been kind of going through some of the musical choices, um, and you know how we might work with that mm. if that eventuates. But it's very difficult to say in the current. Um, yeah, so we kind of we we got to the halfway point in the process, and I think the it was really coming together. We were working with Ryan Stafford, lighting designer, and, and Russell was working closely with all of us. Um, the dancers are a fantastic group. Mm. They were really inspiring to us. Um, and uh, yeah, it was right. almost there. So it would be great if we, at some point we can manage to complete that piece because I think it would be a real shame. Uh, it, was, it was a it would be a good work. Do you have any, um, you know, from your experience and from everything that you know, do you have any sort of advice for young dancers, young dance makers who find themselves inactive in lockdown about how they should proceed and how you find the sort of self-discipline, if, if you like, to carry on? I was talking to some of the National Youth Dance Company dancers about this and um, you know, I think, you know, sometimes the energy is waning for, you know, you're usually going towards something, you're working towards something and, you know, the performances have gone, this is gone, this is gone, you're not, you're not meeting up with people to, um, so you're just on your own. And I, I really think go where the energy is and keep learning because, you know, a lifetime is, it's not, long to learn something when you think about some of the techniques and information that is out there i mean just in terms of knowing about your body knowing about the anatomy and um knowing about many many different styles that inform that 
um, you know, you could work for multiple lifetimes and still be learning. Mm. Um, so if you can find something that piques your interest, follow it because that's, you, you, you can't do slog on, oh, I'm not really interested, but I feel like I should know it. So that's never going to wash. But if, if you can find the aspect of it that is piquing your interest, whether it's learning, popping or shuffle or um, rolfing, martial arts, ballet, you know, any of those um, Well, just interesting work. levels of performance. You know, I think I, I take a lot of inspiration from singers or actors or just mm -hmm. totally different art forms that uh, still involve performance, but, mm. but have a, 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 a different take. Um, but I think uh, most of my kind of great periods of learning were also in, in times where I was injured or didn't have any work or was with ch children or mm. um, coming into the studio and just being quiet in my body and listening, um, taking things in from other things, books, film, um, you take it in in a different way to when your body is up there and being physical. Uh, there's only so much information, I think, that you can take when you're working physically because so much of your concentration goes into your physicality. Um, and the memory for steps and things like this. So when there's finer tuning details, um, sometimes they might go over your head, you know, and, and I think that that being quiet and watching things on YouTube, I mean, there's just endless, endless great iconic performances that are on there if you go a bit be below the surface, you know. So um, control your algorithms. And you, you, you have been putting up the Russell Maliphant Dance Company performances. They've been up on, online on, on your um, uh, YouTube channel. I mean, what, Russell, when you watch those digitally, how do you see them differently than you see them in the theatre? How do you see you watch digital dance differently? Um, it, it, depends on, it depends on many, many things. Um, I, I often, because I'm working three-dimensionally, we're working with live energies and sometimes there's a mirroring response in your neurons or there's a kinesthetic response to a movement in the, in the studio. I, I haven't worked so much with film where I watch it for the films, say. I'm watching it because I'm looking at what the dancers are doing and how to go to the next stage or choreographically what we might shift. Yeah, just using it as a tool. Yes. So, um, you know, beginning to put things out on the digital archive, it's really more about sharing process and what that process um, entails and You'll see it. You'll see aspects of the performance, and depending on you know, was it a three-camera shoot or was it me just doing it from the back of the auditorium on a camcorder and whispering into the back of it, or um, yeah, you know, what was it for? But if there's a if there's a a logic to sharing it, or there's something that I think is you know very beautiful happening on the stage. Um, you know, very few of the things have been created for that film. So I, I often feel uh, the, the things that are missing in the experience. Um, but if it's, say if it's the commercial work, then the commercial work is made for the film. And it's made for that output. So it's, um, I don't feel that lack in those things. Um, I, I sometimes miss that live element, but if a great performance is captured, it's, it's, it's great to see. And I, um, I had a really nice experience watching 
on Facebook when um, you're watching with others. And so, you know, the, the, the thread of information from different people is going through. That was, that was a fun yeah. uh, sharing. Kind of. And the company's 25 years next year, isn't it? I mean, do you have plans for the future? How, how, how do you feel when you face the future? I mean, Ben Ockrey made a, a film for this Coronet series where he talked about needing to find a new way perhaps into the future that is better than the past. I mean, have you started to think about those kind of things? Um, where we go in the future? Yeah. And uh, how you celebrate and how you're going to celebrate your 25 years? Well, this I mean, we were going to, we talked about many different ways of celebrating um, and, you know, in some ways doing another work seemed, well, that's kind of what we do anyway. So that's not, um, that doesn't make it different than 24 years or 26 years or 27 years, you know. Um, so we thought we have amassed many different interesting photographs over the years. Um, Dan has taken many of me in the studio with um, lots of different, Robert Lepage or Sylvie or um, all the dancers from the company and um, many, many different people. And some of those are fantastic. And we've, we've been lucky enough to do some shoots with some brilliant photographers over the years. So we have many of productions through time and we did think that uh, it might be nice to have a gallery kind of showing where we can you can have a walk through the processes of um, captured on um, on photograph and maybe there would be some um, maybe there would be some digital video uh, that we would gather together um, as we're looking to put the archive together you know, I'm having to look through a lot of stuff anyway. Um, so that, that could be a way, but we'll, you know, at the moment we'll have to see. Yeah, these has got time. And will there be, this is a popular question, will there be a Maliphant Works for? Probably not for me, um, in a performance aspect. Uh, Maliphant Works 3 was, my final performance um, on stage and uh, so I don't know that's up to Ander and and Russell I suppose. Mm. Yeah I mean I don't know if I will dance again like you um, but we'll we'll see and uh, you know I'm happy to make I love making work so and I'm, I love performing to, there so uh, or of seeing performances there, so we'll see. Yeah, so that, that would be something for everyone to look forward to, I think. I mean, it would be really nice. So thank you ever so much for talking to me. I hope that people have enjoyed the conversation. I, I certainly have. It's been really, really interesting and covered a lot of ground. So thank you, Russell. Thank you, Dana. Thanks, Great Sarah. to see you. Thank and you. Thanks, thank you. Watching. Yes, thank you, everyone. Watching, yes. <laughs>